Uh, but yeah, we will get back to why we're talking about slash fic uh, a little later in this episode. Will we? Yeah, I think sort of. Do you want to give a heaving sigh to that? Yeah, but I was holding it back. <laughs> well, we have been creating our own fictional universe recently by playing more Stardew Valley. Yeah, this has been your first time playing it. I started playing it obsessively during much of 2020. Yeah, you know, we talked about this early on in pandemic. As we mentioned uh, last episode, time is a flat circle and we're just right back where we started again. As everybody knows by this point, but it's really, there's been a resurgence in our playing of Stardew Valley as escapism, the, the uh, gardening, farming simulator that is Stardew Valley. And you had been playing it uh, a lot last year, but I have begun playing it with you more intensively as your farm hand. Is that your designation? I think so, yeah. Okay. I'm the secondary character to your primary character. You're the protagonist, just like in our lives, <laughs> you are the protagonist and I am a supplementary character. It does allow us to sleep in the same bed at night if we want to, Yeah, which we elect to do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, neither of us has decorated the inside of our cabins in this particular save yet. Mm. And the main house, we also haven't built any expansions to it. So they look identical inside. So if one of us goes to bed first, it's impossible to tell which bed the other one is in. Like mm. then you just enter a building randomly and then I'm not going to leave that building and go into the other one to go to bed. <laughs> well, in our perfect communist future, all rooms are, are the same anyway. So we're just living that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our game of Stardew Valley, your character's name is Roman. Mm. And in our game of Stardew Valley, uh, your character's name is Allison. And in this, our perfect communist present, we are recording an episode of CD Business. It's CD Business. It's CD Business. So we're recording today. It is Sunday early afternoon. It is, we've had our, our two hottest days of the year yesterday and today there have been heat advisories and this we live as we've mentioned like four blocks from the water so the temperatures here are moderated by that of course we are having nothing compared to what the fucking pacific northwest has been experiencing this year in terms of heat but you know we've had our we've had heat advisories over the last couple of days the sun has been beating down on us and on our i guess you can still call it a garden it's hard to say not there's not much there's not much left allison what what is left in the garden then let us cultivate our garden it's the only way to make life endurable Well, we have a bunch of tomatoes, which are not ripening. I don't understand why they aren't red. They've I, just been green for weeks. Yeah, I looked it up and it says if it's too hot, they don't <laughs> ripen. So that seems like that explains it. I have been. That's interesting. I have been following people on Twitter who've been saying, why aren't my tomatoes getting red this year? Like I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, we've just had these green tomatoes for weeks and weeks now. And apparently the number one cause of tomatoes not ripening is it's too hot. Well, there's not a lot to do about that. I yeah, guess. we really can't solve that problem. And I wonder if that is also why the melons are quite stunted and are, are also not ripening. That, that might be a general too thing hot. that happens with fruit when it's too hot. I was reading some. So when we talk about uh, vegetables today, we're going to be talking about like parsnips and cauliflower and reading some descriptions of those but i was reading some reviews of uh, cauliflowers on the burpee site as usual there's one real cursed cauliflower i think called the corona cauliflower so already that is a tainted name forever and burpee describes it as the the whitest of white cauliflowers which I guess is good. Like, I don't I don't see them describe eggplants as the most purple eggplant or carrots as the orangest 
But when something's white, baby, you want people to know it's the absolute whitest. (laughs) But then I saw, uh, you know, everyone was having trouble growing it. And uh, a lot of the complaints in the reviews were, it's not white. It's not white enough. (laughs) (laughs) So I wonder if uh, that has to do with the heat. Also, the one woman was saying that she brought it inside under like lamps for the first eight weeks and then took it outside and went through some sort of blanching process. And I thought, boy, that seems like a lot of work to get yourself a sufficiently white cauliflower. I guess it's an aesthetic (laughs) preference. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, that's the whole thing. (laughs) But anyway, man. (laughs) But anyway, the, uh, (laughs) yes, we got tomatoes that won't ripen. Got melons that are the same size as they were several weeks ago. I did recently improve the staking of our kumquat tree. Yeah, we talked about that last time. And since that happened, there's been a, a new crop of blossoms. Yeah. It has flowered again. And so I wonder if relieving some of the weight from the branches has triggered them to make more fruit. Which is shocking because already there were so many fruits on them, like a shocking amount of fruits. And now they're flowering again and they're going to be even more. I mean, we'll see how it goes. But the guide I read suggested that we don't need to thin the fruits. We can just take a laissez-faire approach and Mm -hmm. see what happens. We do need to fertilize it. Is that how you get fruit to overproduce in general is to... If you build support for branches, is there some biochemical cue that's like actually put more fruit on this? I don't know the answer to that. I would assume, yes, I would assume there's some kind of feedback loop where if a branch is stressed to the breaking point, more fruit wouldn't be growing on it. But I don't really know the answer. Yeah. Anyway, it's getting their size wise where like I'm like, boy, I'm going to eat one of these. I know I'm going to do it. I know I shouldn't. Wait, you're going to eat a green one? Wait, why are you going to eat a green kumquat? Well, they're big enough where I think there's going to be some good juice in this now. No. (laughs) Is it going to be nasty if I eat them? It's not time yet. But will they be nasty? I assume, yeah. All right, we'll see. What we should get next if we want another citrus, I think we should get one of those limes where you can use the leaves for stuff, like a kaffir lime. Because then you can... Because then you can enjoy it year round, not just when the... You can get use out of it all the time. Yeah. We haven't made Thai food in a while. No, that sounds great, though. Everything else is dead pretty much in the garden. Yep, pretty much. Oh, except that pumpkin plant that my coworker gave me. The one that's acclimated for this. That he said is specifically adapted to this microclimate is growing pretty well, actually. It looks good. I put it in the ground. (laughs) And I think it had three leaves when I put it in the ground. And I think it had seven or eight leaves today. Okay, great. Well, that's maybe that's the way to do it is just to get plants from established growers in our neighborhood. Yeah, he also gave me a lavender plant that he said was adapted to this location. Mm. I've not put that one in the ground yet, but maybe I should. I was thinking about putting it in a big pot, but if it likes being here, why not stick it in the ground here? Yeah, great idea. I feel like was like the heir to a lavender fortune, like some sort of major lavender grower. That's the kind of person we should have on this podcast, but I can't possibly go and request that they are on this podcast. Really, who we should get in touch with. I'm not sure the heir to a lavender fortune knows about growing lavender. I think they had to work on the farm when they were a kid. So maybe there's something there. Someone we should maybe talk to is, do you remember that in like when they got that house, it was like a botanist that owned it. Maybe we should try to get the contact information for that botanist. Look, I know a lot of botanists. That's not the issue. The issue is whether we want to have information on this podcast or just bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. And that's a branding decision that we have to make. I don't think we've come to a decision (laughs) on that yet. Someday we'll decide which one of those things this podcast should be. I mean, I guess we could have a spinoff podcast that's for actual information, (laughs) but I don't know know how much crossover we're going to get there. All right, well, let's transition into our bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) So today we thought we would, as we've been playing so much Stardew Valley lately, 
uh, we've played through the entire season of spring on Stardew Valley. So today's episode uh, is not devoted to one specific catalog, but it is devoted to the crops grown during the spring season of Stardew Valley, the video game. And we're going to read some descriptions from various catalogs of these crops. Will you sample some of the Stardew Valley music? Yeah, absolutely. When you're mixing the podcast. First, I want to ask you, so now that you've played through your first season of Stardew Valley, what do you think of the game? Well, I like it. It's relaxing. I have, when we get up each day, I have daily chores that I perform, which involve, th- there are three chores each day. They are to pet our cat. Lucy. <laughs> Yeah, which we've just (laughs) simply named Lucy, like our actual cat, who I also pet every day as a chore. When you pet your cat each day, a heart bubble emerges from your cat, demonstrating that it loves you, I guess. Uh, And then I also, my second chore is to fill the cat's water dish. And then my third chore is to water our garden. Yep. On days when it rains, I only have to do one of those chores, which is to pet the cat, because the other two chores are handled by rainwater. Beyond that, mostly you perform all of the tasks that advance the game in any way, and I've been going fishing. I guess we've been doing doing strong gender roles where I go fishing and sell the fish and make our fortune. While I fight monsters in the mines. While you fight monsters in the mines, right. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I find it to be soothing. I find the scoring, which presumably I have edited in under our conversation right now, to be soothing. The music is great. It is great. I do enjoy the festivals that occur. This is like a somewhat pagan society, I guess. Yeah, so let's describe the game of Stardew Valley, I guess, briefly, in case anyone doesn't know what it is. It's a farming simulator game. So you, your character inherits an old farm from your grandfather. Yes. And you decide to leave your job at the soul-sucking Amazon-style corporation. It's supposed to be specifically amazon I yes, think, right, absolutely. like the iconography that they present at the beginning is a take on Amazon. There's also a skeleton in your workspace <laughs> of an of a co-worker who died at work and has right. been left there until they were skeletonized. Are there pee bottles around? There, I don't know that I've ever noticed any pee bottles. Yeah. But anyway, so you leave your job at Amazon and move to your grandfather's farm and rehabilitate the farm. And you remove the weeds and you plant new crops and you get to build buildings and get farm animals and stuff like that. And you also make friends with the villagers who reside in the town. And you can also go to the mines and collect resources, but also monsters will attack you when you go in there. So you have to fight them. Yeah. The thing I like least about this game is that there are monsters in the mines, which I find to not be soothing when I'm looking for an exclusively soothing experience. But you can also go fishing. There's a fishing mini game. So yeah. you've gotten really into that part of it. And you can also forage. You can wander around collecting flowers and edible plants that Mm. pop up randomly. And uh, there are four seasons. Each season is 28 days long, so four weeks. And we have played through now together as farmer and farmhand one 28-day season of spring. The main crops that one deals with during the spring season are, first and foremost, parsnips. Yes, parsnip is your starter crop. They give you a packet of parsnip seeds at the beginning. I mean, that is an odd main crop to grow, right? Yeah. Although, honestly, a root vegetable has got to be among the most nutritious. Are parsnips really good for you? Sure. I mean, they're sort of a carrot. Well, the Stardew Valley description of parsnips are that they are a spring tuber closely related to the carrot which has an earthy taste and is full of nutrients. In Stardew Valley, they take four days to grow from seed to to complete maturation, which, if only. Do we want to read a few actual descriptions of parsnips? Sure, let's do it. First, I'll read the overview on parsnips from the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange 2021 catalog. 
This hearty root vegetable develops a sweet, nut-like flavor after it has been heavily frosted. Parsnips were once a common vegetable at the dinner table, and they deserve to come back in style. In the 1800s, parsnips were often used to make marmalade and wine. Parsnip wine, huh? Well, maybe that's a project. I guess it does not frost heavily here, so right. never mind. <laughs> we won't be growing any parsnips anytime soon. I just found a recipe online for making old-fashioned parsnip wine. What are the basic steps? Th- this also wants you to make sure they're exposed to a few hard frosts, first of all. Um, beyond the parsnips, the recipe includes lemon slices and raisins, but then both of those are filtered out before the fermentation begins. So the parsnips provide basically just the flavor in this recipe. They're not really providing much of the fermenting fuel. So you, but you cook and mash the parsnips? Yeah. The first thing you do is to slice up the parsnips, boil them in water, Then you do what I mentioned with the raisins and the lemons and the sugar. Then you combine the the syrup and the parsnip water together. Then you uh, bloom some yeast and water, put the parsnip syrup mixture into some sort of fermentation vessel, uh, add the yeast, and allow it to ferment for seven to ten days, basically. All right. Well, this seems like a project we should do, but not perhaps while we live here. Yeah. But the idea of making parsnip wine is very, I don't know why, but it's very appealing to me as an absolutely, I mean, whose first choice would that be? (laughs) (laughs) So you've also got the territorial seed catalog over there that has three parsnip descriptions in it, I believe. Yes. And their names are very aggressive. So the the parsnip varieties they carry are Gladiator, White Spear, and Javelin. Like those are all violent names? Yeah, I guess so. Or maybe Greek names somehow? Or maybe I just have the Olympics on the mind. Well, in the Olympic context, I guess, in the context of the Olympics, Javelin is not violent per se. It's not a weapon of war that's often (laughs) used these days, but Gladiator. You'll be impressed from the start with Gladiator's quick germination and vigorous early growth. The vitamin-rich, cream-colored roots have a clean, parsnipy sweetness that makes it the most flavor-packed parsnip we've had the pleasure to eat. The smooth, tapered roots reach 7 inches when they're ready for the kitchen. Try Gladiator in stews or grated in salads. Seed is from England. So it has a parsnipy taste. Yeah, I was going to say. It tastes the most was, like a parsnip of all the parsnips. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, in an otherwise good description, that is not particularly helpful. Yeah, that's it's not evocative. <laughs> but it does twice say this tastes like a parsnip. Mm. So if you want a parsnip that tastes like a parsnip, Gladiator's the one to get. Mm. Yeah, read another one. White Spear. This outstanding cultivar is one of the most productive and mighty parsnips we've seen. Strong plants produce tapered roots with hefty shoulders and refined, smooth skin. Performs equally well when sown in spring or late summer. Left in the ground, late crops of white spear pierce depths up to 36 inches with their immense roots. I mean, that's pretty intense. It is an intense description. A meter-long parsnip. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess these are, I mean, they're shaped essentially like a carrot, which is a the shape of a stabby thing. So I guess that's why they have these names. But I don't know, when I see carrot descriptions, they're not usually named like broadsword or shit like that, you know? I'm just surprised that the one that is a meter long isn't the one called javelin. Mm-hmm. That could actually be used as a javelin. <laughs> and finally, javelin. Javelin is uniform and high-yielding, producing slender, 8-inch, wedge-shaped roots that are smooth-skinned and easy to clean. Creamy ivory flesh is tasty and sweet, wonderful in winter stews or simply sliced and roasted with a touch of salt. That sounds good, and it's making me wish for cooler weather when it would be nice to have like a roasted vegetables or a stew, something wintry tall glass of parsnip wine that's particularly parsnippy. I did want to critique that description briefly, which is just to say 
it does not allow you to identify any characteristics of this cultivar that are unique. It doesn't tell you why you should grow this one as compared to the other two. One of them, its unique feature is that it's especially parsnipy. <laughs> one of them, its unique feature is that it's especially big. Then the third one, there's no... The implication is it's smaller than the second one and somehow and less, less parsnipy. parsnipy than the first one, yeah. Yeah, why, why would I want that? What are you talking about? Yeah, that's fair. They should have said what it, it's good for wine or something mm-hmm. to give it a little, make it special. <laughs> anyway. What were you going to say about growing parsnips in Stardew Valley? Part of the process of ingratiating yourself, the community, is to give gifts to various various characters. But the issue is that the majority of them appear to hate when you give them things. Yeah, they're very rude about it. Yeah, too. they'll, like, if you try to give them a parsnip, they may say, this is disgusting. <laughs> and I can't, and then like you less for your gift. There's only one character who wants a parsnip, and that character is Pam. Yeah, Pam's all right. Pam, I like Pam. She's treated poorly by the game. She lives in a trailer. She's the only one who lives in a trailer instead of a house. And the, there's nothing, uh, importantly, that, that should not be looked down upon in any way. But then they also treat her as though she's an alcoholic. Yeah. She's an alcoholic who lives in a trailer in the game, which is not a choice I love for character building. But she does appreciate the gift of a parsnip, which I did present to her on her birthday, and we became friends. Pam's a good friend. The the best first friends in Stardew Valley are Pam and Linus. Yeah. And I think it's no coincidence that they're at the margins of society. Yeah. Linus is the self-described wild man who lives in a tent, uh, which is certainly... A step down from a trailer, I guess. Right. But yeah, Pam and Linus are the ones who, first of all, they will actually befriend you with the gifts you have available to you early in the game. Mm. Yeah, it's good. They're real friends. You got to keep them over the course of the game. Don't push them aside once you get better stuff than parsnips. Exactly. Yeah. What's the deal with you were insistent that we had to grow a gold quality parsnip? Yes. Why is that good and what does that mean? We need five gold star quality parsnips for the quality crops bundle, which... Is that how to make your grandfather proud of you? So the ghost of your grandfather haunts you in this game well, and periodically comes back to evaluate how, <laughs> how successful you've been in reviving his garden. Yeah, I guess... We should say there are spoilers for Stardew Valley. Yeah, spoiler alert. I'll we put should that probably in the say at the notes. beginning, lots of spoilers for Stardew Valley. But yeah. specifically, if you complete all the bundles, you refurbish the town's community center, hmm. which allows the people of the town to have a new gathering place mm-hmm. and a place where they can do their hobbies. Nice. So one of your goals in the game It's not just to rehabilitate the farm you inherited, but you actually rehabilitate the entire town. You fix the community center. You fix the broken bus line. Um, Is there some sort of villain who wants to keep the community center from being built? Yeah, it's the manager of the local Amazon warehouse. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Wow, I love it. Yeah. And if you succeed in rehabilitating the community center, which of course they want to buy in order to build another warehouse Mm -hmm. on the land, then they're defeated and they leave forever. That sounds so good. And to embark on this process, you need very high quality parsnips, gold quality parsnips. That's right. Mm. All right. Well, the main other crop that we grew in this spring season is cauliflower, which we mentioned briefly earlier in terms of it being prized for its whiteness. I don't think that's an aspect in this game, but cauliflower takes way longer to grow than parsnips do. Parsnip from seed to completion, as we mentioned, is four days. With cauliflower, it's like, takes several weeks. It's 14 days. 14 days. 14 days. And the Stardew Valley description of cauliflower is valuable, but slow growing. Despite its pale color, the florets are packed with nutrients. This can become a giant crop. 
I don't know what that means. Uh, you can also use it as a white dye, apparently, when making clothing. Yeah, we're very far away from being able to dye clothing. Mm. You can also make cheesy cauliflower with it if you learn that recipe. Yeah, which you did. Yeah, it sounds really good. I'd like to have some of that right now. Would you like to read some cauliflower descriptions? Yeah, why don't you read them? So again, I will first read the overall description from the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange 2021 catalog for cauliflower. Culture of cauliflower is similar to broccoli and cabbage. Blanching the curd. When white head or curd begins to form, tie the top leaves together over it to protect the curd from sunlight that causes the curd to yellow. Harvest while the curd is in the tight bud stage. Don't harvest for storage when heads are wet. The curds will mold in storage, and they carry one or two varieties each of a spring cauliflower and a fall cauliflower. Mm. So you really have to go out of your way to make sure it's white. Yeah, so their spring cauliflower is early snowball. Highly recommended for the mid-Atlantic, the best in our trials of spring-planted cauliflower. Good coverage of the curd by wrapper leaves. Head denser than other early snowball varieties. Compact plants can also be used for fall crops. And then they have a they have two fall cauliflowers. One is the snowball original, and the other is snowball self-blanching. So Ooh. there's an improved yeah, snowball. Yeah, I want to hear about the self-blanching snowball. Self-wrapping leaves protect the white curds from heat and sunlight during late summer or early fall. No tying of the leaves is necessary unless heads grow larger than six inches in diameter. During hot weather, growth slows until cooler weather, thus preventing formation of undersized heads. Oh, so they bred a cultivar that could wrap itself so you didn't have to tie it up. That's pretty cool. That is very cool. Not to go too far afield, but a kind of cool paper came out in the last few weeks um, showing a a mathematical model for how cauliflower grows. Mm. I mean, it looks sort of like fractals or something, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And they specifically were trying to figure out how, you know, in the Romanesco cauliflowers, which have that fractal pattern, how does that emerge? And so they were comparing the growth of sort of standard cauliflower curds versus the, the fractal growth. And they found how the fractals actually emerge from the standard cauliflower branching pattern. Well, maybe we should link to this paper. Yeah. I I mean, it's a pretty high profile paper. They didn't do any, I don't think they did any empirical experiments, Mm. but they they essentially provide a really plausible mathematical model for how it works. Mm. Is is this a a math paper that came out or? I mean, I guess it's biology. I guess it's biology. Yeah. It was in science or nature Mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks. We can link to it. Cool. So what's the value in the game of cauliflower? Oh, I don't know the selling price of cauliflower. I guess I mean, what is it? Not not its value in in gold in the game, but who likes it? What's it good for? One of the festivals, you have to make a community stew. Can you put it in that stew? Well, you don't know anything about that soup yet. (laughs) We're not, you haven't, I've only told you about it. Is that a summer festival? That's a summer festival. We'll get there. Yeah, I mean, it's considered... High value. People sometimes will request it specifically. I believe right now there's a quest from Jody. Jody has asked us to bring her a cauliflower. <laughs> to what end? Her requests always say, I want to cook X for dinner. Can you bring me Y ingredient? So parsnips, I mentioned they're only Pam likes them. They're hated by Abigail, Sam, Vincent, and Haley. Abigail, Sam, Vincent, and Haley also hate cauliflower. Are those the emo kids? No. So Abigail and Sam, I guess you would say, are in that clique of emo kids. Uh huh. But Do the they one just who hate dresses vegetables in general. No, I don't think so. But the one who dresses really emo is um, Sebastian. Okay. So he's not on that list. Mm. He's the the true emo dresser. Vincent is one of the children. Okay. Haley is the one who's extremely rude, the blonde one. Okay. Who so the people who is hate very it, rude. Who hate these things as gifts are children, cool kids, and one rude lady. Yeah. But cauliflower is loved by Maru. Who's Maru? I, I guess you haven't met her yet. She is Sebastian's half sister. Oh, okay. Well, I got to give her some cauliflower. 
Yeah, she also likes strawberries and batteries. <laughs> <laughs> can you grow batteries? Yeah. You can grow batteries. Well, we're not there yet. Oh, wow. Okay. But yeah, you can produce batteries. Incredible. One very small complaint I have about Stardew Valley is that the seasons for the crops don't always align with the seasons for the same crops here on Earth. Right. Like a kale is a summer crop or a spring crop in this game. Yeah. And in particular, the one that bothers me the most is that green beans are a spring crop and peas are a summer crop. When, mm. of course, the reverse is true. Uh -huh. uh, again, well, here on Earth. This is pretty damning, actually. Well, they live, it's pretty clear they live on another planet of some <laughs> kind. Yeah, I guess that's that's an ex that's one explanation. What other spring crops are there? Did we grow any of them? Yeah, we grew. I wouldn't know. I was off fishing like a real man. We grew all of them. We grew some kale. We grew some potatoes. We grew some green beans and we grew some strawberries. Wow. So we got all the major spring crops. Ooh, to go back to our own real life garden for a second. The strawberries aren't dead yet. No, they are alive and it, they, they're, they look one is better. flowering, actually. Yeah, they look better than they have looked, actually. So yeah, that's one thing to look forward to. Yeah, I was pretty worried all those plants were going to die, but about half of them have made it. Yeah. And they're all looking pretty good now. Yeah. Well, we encourage you to check out Stardew Valley if you haven't. But in investigating Stardew Valley and its its history, I also have come across, are you aware that there's a whole ecosystem of specifically queer farming sims? Yeah, I mean, Stardew Valley, I don't know that it's, it's certainly not the first or only such game. Mm. And I think it's become really popular in the last year and a half, but there are a bunch of games yeah, that have a similar format. And I guess we didn't say when describing the game, besides making friends with the townspeople, you can also date and marry them. Mm. You can date, marry them, you know, uh, regardless of sort of, of gender pairings, uh, which is not true in, in video games historically. You can also divorce them and then they like become a bird or something. What's the deal with that? <laughs> No, if you divorce them, they don't like you anymore. Oh, they don't like you anymore. But can you, you can, remarry? Yeah, you can remarry. You could marry each one of them if you want. Can you have a poly group? You cannot. Oh. But you... Wow. You can, I <laughs> How think... How puritanical. You can cast a magic spell that erases their memory so they don't hate you anymore after you divorce them. Oh, wow. Them. Jeez. So you can't like talk like uh, mature adults and reconcile your differences, but you can muster the occult to make them like you again. Yeah. But if you get tired of having your children, you can turn them into birds, <laughs> which I have done in my original game. Do I have to worry about that with any future children we might have? Wow. Don't put that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I pulled up a bunch of interesting, there've been Bunch of think pieces. Incidentally, you know, we are, uh, Allison and I are two people who are in a uh, opposite gender pairing who I think independently would self-identify as queer. Or So we, we're, we're coming from, from that place uh, when we talk about this. But there's a, a piece from earlier this year that I'll link to is 2021, the year of the queer farming sim. Like, it, it is not surprising to me that there are queer and queer coded video games that are emergent. That makes all the sense in the world or or even specifically like sim, you know, sims, well, like like the sims, you know, the video mm. game. It's Which not, is also extremely popular and I mean, has been continuously, but I think has had a resurgence because of COVID. Yeah, no doubt. And like we've talked about Second Life before, it, it, it makes sense to me for the purposes of escapism that these are are popular, especially now, and it makes sense to me that li life simulators where you can embody your queerness in some in whatever way you choose are very popular right now. But specifically farming simulators, that is what really gets me. We found <laughs> there's like a some somebody's undergrad thesis from the University of Calgary on queer performance in farming simulation role play games uh there's 
an article from the New York Times this year specifically about Stardew Valley that is titled Live Your Gay Millennial Pandemic Fantasy in Stardew Valley. (laughs) Uh, There's a piece from Extra Magazine from 2020, The Inherent Queerness of Farming Games. You know, we I can uh, link to some of these, certainly, but like there's a real hunger for the coziness of off the grid, self-sufficient living simulators, I guess, that maybe I don't know. how. Wh- why do you think that is that is so appealing to queer communities? It might just be that people who want to develop a game that is inherently gentle and community oriented uh-huh. and not about whatever action adventure it might just be that those sorts of people would have a value of inclusivity in their game design in the first place right yeah because you know it's interesting there's sort of there are competing desires here in these video games where like the the point of stardew valley is like oh you're living in the big city with all the hustle hustle and bustle and you want to like get away from it get away from it to some place where you have some some space and and there's a there's a desire for solitude, space and solitude within that, but then also to build a community of people when you're there. Mm. I don't know. It reminds me of like the drive to li- communal living, like the commune living or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Cottage core. Is yeah, the, cottage core is, the, is definitely the, the aesthetic here. Yeah. I don't know. I mean... I'm not that much of a gamer. I don't know what other kinds of sims there are. Like, if you are a character who's, like, making your way in the world, I understand, you know, Animal Crossing, you decorate your house and you pick fruit and flowers and go fishing. It's a lot of the same activities. But there aren't, I don't know what jobs you would do in a sim. Like, is there a bakery sim where you make cakes and decorate cookies. I'm sure they but exist. But you romance but there people, are, like wh- right, where's yeah. the, yeah, is the making friends or dating people. I don't know what other kinds of jobs mm-hmm. uh, you do in games where you also <laughs> make friends and or date. Yeah. In any case, I looked up a couple more of these games that are maybe more explicitly gay than Stardew Valley is. There is... Morning Dew Farms is a popular one. Uh, I've watched some videos about it. It is a explicitly gay farming simulator. Here's the opening bit of it. I can't believe it. My dream has come true. I've moved into my granddaddy's old farm, and I'm going to make it all my own. So it's basically the, the backstory. It's basically the backstory of Stardew Valley. <laughs> Dang, this place is really run down. It's going to take a long time to get things up to par. Hey, Cody. Sis, how you doing? So Cody is a real ripped guy. He's wearing overalls with one strap down so you can see like a rippling peck underneath it. Am I Cody? When I play the game, are you always Cody? You're always Cody. Yeah. Are you all moved in? I came over to invite you to dinner tonight. Well, I didn't have much to move in. Just some personal stuff in my old Navy cot. There ain't a lick of furniture in there. Yeah, it was cleaned out by vagrants. This place has been abandoned for ages. That's for true. It's a little more rustic than I was expecting. But it's in a great location. The village of Morning Dew is a total gayberhood. (laughs) Oh, come on, sis. Don't embarrass me now. What's to be embarrassed about? This is the perfect place for you to meet your future husband. (laughs) First, you'll need to get your life in order. No one's going to want to be with you if you don't renovate the shack, get it furnished, <laughs> and get the electricity turned on. So the backstory is also renovate that... Renovate the shack! Yeah, is also that you inherited the farm from your grandfather. But I guess your sister has been living in this community and notes that it's in fact a gayberhood. But in order to find someone who will want to marry you, you have to renovate the the farmhouse that was ransacked by quote-unquote vagrants <laughs> and then build a, a good farm. Fortunately, you don't have to worry about water or sewer. The septic system and well are in good working order. There's a chance I would have to worry about the septic system in this game? I don't know. Maybe. Does it, can your septic system break in this game? Possibly. Now I'm concerned. 
the first thing you have to do is go to the county store to get uh, some supplies. I'll cut to that scene uh, where you meet, besides your sister, your your first other character. His name is Butch. He's sort of a... Hell yeah. Yeah, he's a bear, you know, archetype who runs the county store. Welcome to the country store. If you need anything, just holler, okay? Wait a minute. You're new here, aren't you? Yep, I just moved into my granddaddy's place, Morning Dew Farms. Morning Dew Farms? Why, you must be Sissy Plowman's brother. Okay, so your last name is Plowman in this game. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, it is pretty good. That's right, I'm Cody. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, I'm Butch. Nice to meet you, Butch. At this point, a uh, box pops up and you get to pick between... He's a hunky sex a man meat, or he seems friendly. So you say what you think of him. Yeah. To the game. Yeah. So if he's your type that you want to potentially have romance with, you might say he's a hunk of sexy man meat. But if you just want to remain on good terms with him, you click he seems friendly. I'm glad the old Morning Dew Farm will be back in operation. You planning on working the land? I sure am. I dreamed of being a self sufficient farmer my whole life. Wow, I'm impressed. Not many young people interested in signing up for that kind of life. I feel like it's a way to be totally independent. I'll grow all my own food. I won't have to be a slave of some boring old office. That's fantastic. I love your attitude. And you know, when society collapses, you'll be doing (laughs) just fine. (laughs) You know, WTSHTF? WT. When the shit hits the fan? (laughs) <laughs> there won't be air conditioning or supermarkets during T.O. Twaggy. T.O. The end of the world as we know it. <laughs> it will be a desolate wasteland. The weak and unprepared will wither as the strong set up bastions of power. Food, water, and medicine are your new currency. A man will sell his own child for a plate of beans. <laughs> and fire will rain from the... Oh, oh, look at me carrying on. (laughs) I bet you came in here for some supplies, right? Wow. I mean, I love that they do that after you've decided whether he's sexy Sexy or or not. not. Yeah. Then they reveal that he's a maniac. He's a prepper. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really in the zeitgeist, this game. There's also, uh, so this like has, has narrative as well as farming elements to it. There's also a game that's even more explicitly sexual, which is called Cockville Farms, which adds in, quote, a healthy dose of erotic narrative to the mix. You're a in which you're a business savvy newcomer and your mission is to meet service and seduce the hot guys of Cockville. New beginnings are a thrilling ride and your friendly neighbors will jump at the chance to guide your hand and your cock in the right direction I looked for a some sort of video of this also, but I could only find one clip of it being played by what appears to be a Korean girl on YouTube. So you could j- try to investigate that further if you'd like. But yeah, there's a whole ecosystem of this stuff. All right. Well, before we go, we uh, we did get another uh, nice comment that we wanted to call out on Twitter. Goody Bold Italic said about us, do your podcasts angry up your blood and keep you awake at night? Then you want seedy business, the podcast where two people natter pointlessly, then talk about a seed catalog they got. (laughs) I love (laughs) it. I think it's nice. (laughs) (laughs) We also had a landmark uh, occurrence, which is we got our first, it was not a written review, but we did get a one star review on uh, Apple podcasts, which I think we were both delighted by. You know, there's that drill tweet that goes something like, go ahead, keep screaming, shut the fuck up at me. It only makes my opinions worse. (laughs) 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 That's that's sort of how I feel about that. So we've made it clearly. Yeah. I mean, if someone who hates our content was able to find it. That seems good. Yeah. How did how did that happen? Actually, what I'd like is more. Instead of just putting a one star, I would like 
<laughs> a written review that is vicious and critical because that would be pretty fun for me. Yeah, I mean, I w- if you are that one star reviewer and you're still out there, you're still listening, please. First of all, why? <laughs> please, please go back and write. Yeah, some write a good review yeah. on the on the review as well because that would be really fun. Agreed. Why not? And if you're so inclined, you can elect to follow us on Twitter at CD Business or on Instagram at CD Business Pod. You can email us at cdbusinesspod at gmail.com. Let us know if you want us to talk about a catalog or if you leave us any sort of remark, we will, of course, read it. And assuming it is a parsnip of gold quality, you should eat your vegetables. We're all just doing the best we can. Speak for yourself. It's CD Business. It's CD Business. Boring talk about seeds, CD talk between boars, mind-numbing chatter 